Okay, uh, thank you, Kim and Mo and Meredith. Um, it's uh, exciting to be uh, presenting here at the, the BPPB virtual seminar. And um, yeah, today I have my two, the two talks. The first one in the tutorial, I'm going to try to review some very sort of fundamental and um, hopefully quite general physical concepts that I think you'll find useful uh, in a broad range of um, contexts. Um, hold on one second, I have to pin my video. Um, and uh, and the, the, there's two contact, two types of problems I'll be discussing. Um, one is generally gonna talk about the coupling between forces or mechanics and phase transitions and review some basic uh, thermodynamics with a classic biological application. And then the second half of, um, the tutorial, I'll introduce you to what I think is a, a really interesting uh, continuum mechanics or solid mechanics problem that uh, is gonna come up in my, in my research talk in the second half, okay? So yeah, so we're gonna start with uh, the, some essential thermodynamics, okay? And whenever you're doing thermodynamics, it's good to start at uh, the beginning, right? And um, we're, so we're gonna, well, maybe not quite at the beginning, we're gonna start at the second law of thermodynamics, okay? And so uh, usually when we learn the second law of thermodynamics um, in a physics course, we usually think about isolated systems and maximizing the entropy. But often, you know, when you're working with uh, living systems, you know, it's more useful to work with the form of uh, the second law of thermodynamics that applies to a small system that is in contact with a thermal reservoir and a mechanical reservoir so that the system stays at constant temperature and constant pressure. And in that case, um, the second law of thermodynamics is expressed in a different way. And it says that the work done by a system as it's going through any process has to be less than uh, the reduction, the rest than the, the chain, yeah, less than the reduction in its free energy as it's going through that process. Okay, and so that's, that's the second law of thermodynamics. And what we really want to do now is we want to focus on phase change. So we want to imagine molecules that can be exchanged between two different phases. And we're going to have phase one and phase two. I'm going to give them very creative names. And in that particular case, that sort of process, it's most convenient to uh, rewrite the second law this way as the difference in the chemical potentials between the two phases. So this says uh, essentially that the process will be spontaneous as long as the things, um, well, this was, I'll, I'll say what it means in a second, but first let me actually define for you that may have forgotten what the chemical potential is. The chemical potential tells us how the free energy of the system changes when we change the number of molecules of a given type, okay? So here dn is the number of molecules that are going from state two to state one or phase two from phase one. Okay, so this is very, very uh, general framework. And um, what I wanna do now is sort of start pushing it towards this problem of force, the coupling force to the phase transition. So we wanna introduce, introduce a few other useful results. So I wanna introduce um, the form, a very useful form of the chemical potential for any dilute system. So this could mean an ideal gas, which is like perfectly dilute, or it could also refer to a dilute solution where we're keeping track of the solute molecules. And uh, in this classic form of the chemical potential, there's two parts. There's one part that depends on temperature that describes, um, uh, all the contributions to the free energy from the velocity distribution, from the solvent interactions, uh, and it's measured at a reference concentration, okay? And then there's a second part that describes the contribution to the, uh, to the free energy from the configurational entropy of the components that are moving around. So here N is the concentration of your dilute object, N0 reference concentration. And so this part, th this term contains all the configurational entropy, and this has uh, velocity distribution solvent interaction. So yeah, so um, this is super generic general stuff, okay? And now what I wanna do is take this and start focusing in on coupling it uh, to a uh, mechanics and a phase transition. But first, let me remind you what happens is if you have a phase transition that occurs, 
when uh, without doing any work, um, there's no volume change, for example, when the, the phase transition happens, then this DW term goes to zero. So uh, the transformation will be, things will move spontaneously from phase one to phase two, as long as the chemical potential is higher in uh, phase one or phase two. And this is a generic example of how you can think about the chemical potential. Things always move from high chemical potential to low chemical potential, just like they do for any other chemical potential. And so eventually things will keep moving from one to two until they're equal to each other. And then the system will be in equilibrium, okay? Now, um, this, is, you know, this is a very general and useful result from thermodynamics. If you haven't heard it before, uh, you know, equating chemical potentials at different, between different species, between different locations in a complex system is a, a, a really handy thermodynamic tool you will use over and over and again. Now let's uh, consider the specific case of uh, coexistence between two phases. Okay, so we'll have one phase which we're gonna assume to be dilute, which I'll indicate with D, okay? And we're gonna have a condensed phase. Um, which we're going to indicate with C, okay? And then equating the chemical potentials, we have that um, the chemical potential of the condensed phase, uh, which only depends on temperature, and I'll explain that in a second, is equal to the chemical potential of the dilute phase, okay? Now, uh, the chemical potential of the dense phase, um, we're assuming that it is very weakly sensitive um, to uh, um, concentrate. The concentration is fixed in the, in the condensed phase. So it, we don't have that concentration dependence in it. But the dilute phase, its concentration can vary. And what happens with any system, anytime you have coexistence between a, um, a dilute phase and a dense phase in equilibrium, what happens is the concentration of the dense phase gets pinned to some special value uh, which is the equilibrium value of the concentration, matter will be exchanged between these two phases until the chemical potentials are equal. And that means that the dense phase has this special concentration, which uh, is often called a saturation concentration or a critical concentration. Okay. So um, what we can do now is we can sort of uh, try to relate. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a useful expression if we just plug in our form for uh, the dilute chemical potential into the expression. We get one term on the left-hand side that relates the, uh, the chemical potential in the, the, the concentrated phase to the dilute phase at the reference uh, concentration. And that gives us our reference difference in the chemical potential. One way to think of this is just, it's very convenient. You can think of it as the binding energy of a molecule uh, as it moves from the dilute phase to the condensed phase. And, uh, and you get this expression that um, relating now the, uh, the concentration in, uh, in equilibrium or the saturation concentration to the binding energy, okay? So this is uh, a very general useful result from thermodynamics. If you're a physicist, uh, hopefully you've seen all this stuff before. Okay, so now I wanna, what I wanna do is take this very, 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 very general stuff and I wanna apply it to a classic problem from biophysics, okay? It's also applicable, you'll see, um, to the phenomenon I'll be talking about in my research talk today, but maybe some of you have seen this in the biophysical context before, and so it's a good fit for this audience. And the problem I wanna discuss is constrained polymerization. And this problem is a beautiful problem. And uh, it's discussed in quite some detail in Joe Howard's book on molecular motors. It's also discussed very nicely in Philip et al.'s book on molecular um, physical biology of the cell. Okay, and the way you think about this problem is you imagine it's a, it's a one dimensional problem and you have two walls that are pushing in with some force F. And then you have some sort of filament and we'll apply this to an actin filament in a little bit. Uh, and then also there's monomer floating around, okay? And there, um, there's some binding energy between the, the monomer and the filament, so it wants to attach. And so there's this competition between adding more monomer to, the extent, to extend the filament versus the work you have to do against that external force. 
Okay, so if you just use that form of the second law that I showed you, you can say, okay, well, the work has to be less than or equal to the change in the chemical potential in the filament state minus the chemical potential in the monomer state. And uh, that's where you start. And then you plug in those, uh, those expressions that I gave you earlier for a dilute system, and you get this really nice expression for the force that uh, this filament can exert during polymerization. It's got to be less than KT divided by DL, DN, and that's basically how much the filament extends when you add a single monomer times the log of the current concentration divided by the concentration when the filament and the uh, monomer are in equilibrium in the absence of an external force. Okay, so this is a, a really beautiful classic result. And um, the, key, the key point of it to, when you see here is that if your concentration is equal to the equilibrium concentration, then the log of one is zero. This filament can't do any work, right? But as your concentration goes beyond the equilibrium concentration, then your filament is capable of pushing on the outside and growing, okay? So the, the place where you might've seen this in a, bio, a biophysical context to make it really concrete for you is an actin polymerization at the leading edge of an adherent cell. So here I've shown uh, schematically the cell membrane. And then as you know, actin polymerizes in a polarized fashion towards the leading edge. And actin, the, the, this polymerization force um, actually pushes the cell membrane forward as one of the important pieces of allowing a cell to advance or uh, uh, allowing a cell to crawl. And the key to do that is that the cell has to maintain at the leading edge a concentration of actin monomer that's higher than the equilibrium concentration. And as long as it can do that, it can keep adding monomer at the leading edge and generate a force to push the membrane, membrane forward. Okay, so this is, you know, this is uh, well-known stuff, okay? And if you haven't seen it before, I've told, I think I've told you enough stuff that you can work through the math and think about it. It's uh, luckily, like most things in thermodynamics, the concepts are subtle, but the math is easy, okay? So, okay, so uh, we'll use this expression or something closely related to it during my research talk. Now I wanna move on to the second thing I wanna tell you about. And this thing is about solid mechanics, okay? And this probably none of you or very few of you have seen in your training if you're a physicist or biologist. And what I love about this problem is that it's really, really super simple. And uh, you can get really far with uh, some really um, fundamental physical concepts and can get away without doing, you don't have to do a ton of math to understand this really beautiful problem in solid mechanics. If you've ever tried to study solid mechanics or fluid mechanics before, you'll find that there's just tons of partial differential equations all over the place. In this problem, beautifully, you don't have to solve a single partial differential equation, and that's why I like it so much. That's one of the reasons I like it so much. So imagine you have some uh, elastic material with some Young's modulus and some Poisson ratio, okay? And inside of that elastic material, you have a cavity. Uh, it doesn't, uh, we're gonna imagine that it is either, a, it has a gas or a liquid inside. And when the pressure inside of that cavity is equal to zero, that cavity has some initial uh, stress-free radius, R is zero. And uh, we can find, uh, if we follow some, select any sort of material point in the solid and uh, identify that it's at some initial distance R zero, okay, this is a way we can sort of keep track of the initial state of the system. Okay, now the question that I wanna consider with you is what happens when I increase the pressure inside the cavity, okay? So the obvious thing is that, you know, as you're increasing the pressure on the inside, this thing is gonna to have to grow. So the, 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 the surface of the cavity is gonna move outward to some new value R instead of R, R zero. And that material point that we were following on the inside is now gonna be at some position little r, okay? And what I wanna show you how to analyze right now or outline how to analyze is how to answer this simple question is how is the radius of this, this hole gonna change when we uh, pressurize the cavity, 
Okay, so at p equals zero, by definition, we've decided that this cavity has some radius r zero. And what we expect is that for small increases in the pressure, we'll get a linear increase of the radius, right? But you know, what is the slope there? And you know, is it linear all the way? What happens? It turns out something magical happens. And that's another reason why this problem is cool. OK, so to solve it, there's just a few physical concepts we have to use, a few assumptions. It becomes really easy if we assume that the matrix, the material surrounding our hole, is incompressible. OK? So incompressibility as a concept can be confusing. What we mean generally by incompressibility is that the shear modulus divided by the bulk modulus is very, very small. And, or in other words, uh, the Poisson ratio is equal to 1 half or very close to 1 half. Um, or you can also be a fluid. Fluids are gen generically uh, incompressible uh, by this approximation, um, not because their bulk modulus is infinite, but because they have zero shear modulus. So if our matrix is incompressible, then we can use uh, mass conservation to very simply uh, figure out how all the material points in the sample move when we inflate the cavity. Okay, and this is especially easy to do because our cavity is isotropic. And if we assume that at least for small deformations, we're assuming that it's remaining spherical, then if we make these two assumptions that things remain spherical and we have mass conservation, then it's super easy to figure out how all the material points move, okay? And so all you have to do is you say, okay, well, how much mass was living between little r0 and big r0 before I inflated everything, okay? And that's little r0 cubed minus big r0 cubed, okay? After the thing has inflated, the mass between um, little r and big R has to be the same, okay? Because the system is incompressible, okay? So with that, you can very easily solve for the position, the final position of any material point in the solid based on the initial radius uh, of the cavity, the initial position, and the final position of the cavity, right? So with this very simple assumption, we can uh, fully understand the kinematics of this complicated three-dimensional solid. So normally to do this, you have to solve partial differential equations, but here we got away with skipping all of that. And again, this is super cool because this is completely independent of the constitutive relationship of the material. It doesn't matter if it's a liquid. It doesn't matter if it's a solid. It all, only thing that matters is the, the only assumptions that the only thing that matters is we validate our assumptions, which are that it's incompressible and that it's an isotropic material. So yeah, so uh, this is a, a pretty cool uh, result, and um, with this result, you can uh, calculate exactly how things deform. And now I'm going to show you a movie. It looks like a simulation, but it's actually an exact. Uh, calculation of how um, these things are deforming. So hopefully you can all see my screen now. And what you see is I have a grid. Uh, I'm not doing this calculation on a grid. It's an analytical thing. I'm just putting the grid there so you can visualize the deformation. And on the bottom left-hand corner, you can see my tiny little initial cavity, okay? And then when I hit play, all I'm doing is just calculating how everything in my mesh evolves as I inflate my cavity, okay? And so I think it's amazing and wonderful that you can get so much rich kinematics just by applying something as simple as and, and, and dumb as, um, I'm gonna to try to replay that movie, um, as mass conservation. Let me play that again. Hopefully you can see that. So as you watch that movie, there's two things to I want you to notice about the deformation field. In the radial direction, the, um, the material is very highly compressed, okay? But in the hoop direction, the direction that's sort of along the surface of the cavity, things are very, 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 very highly stretched, okay? So that's an important feature of the deformation I, I want you to note. 
Okay, so this is what the deformation field looks like. Now, how do we use this to solve the, um, for the pressure versus radius relationship? Okay, well, it's really simple. We just use energy conservation, okay? We say, okay, well, we know that for any volume change that we make, the work done by the cavity is just pressure times dv. And all of that work has to go to increasing the energy of our elastic solid, OK? And now we're basically done. The, thing, the key thing we're missing, though, is to be able to calculate the energy in the elastic solid, OK? So what you have to do is you have to integrate over the whole solid the energy density, this w of is uh, energy density. I apologize for using this. I'll make it a curly w so it doesn't look just like work. And, and the, the, so locally in the solid, every single place in the solid, it's storing some elastic energy. And the elastic energy that it's storing is depending on how much it was deformed, OK? But the good news is that we know exactly how everything is deformed, OK? Now, if you want to do um, what's really nice here is that we haven't so far haven't made any assumptions that the deformations are small. Normally, when we do solid mechanics, we have to use small deformation approximations. It turns out in this problem, you don't have to make small deformation approximations. But anyway, I want to point out what this energy density would look like in the small deformation approximation, because a lot of you may have some familiarity with small deformation solid mechanics. And so the energy density generally has this really simple form. Um, it looks like it's 1 half times Young's modulus times basically the matrix square or the tensor square of the strain. I love this because it looks like 1 half kx squared, OK? And I like to think of things simply. And so here, I'm using Einstein notation. So what you're doing is you're summing over the products of all the elements of the strain tensor. And you can calculate, of course, now that we know how all the pieces are moving, just by taking derivatives of the displacements over space, we can determine all those elements of the strain tensor. OK, but I'm, I'm not going to go through the math because I just want to give you the result uh, because it's a sort of a shocking result. OK, and the result I'm giving you applies also for large deformations. I'm not assuming small deformations, but I am going to assume that my material is linear. So you might hear about uh, uh, materials that have nonlinear rheology or nonlinear elasticity. I'm assuming that my material has a linear response. OK, so you could call this a linear solid. And then what you find, and here's the magic, is that you would expect at zero pressure, you get the initial radius, OK? At first, the radius of the cavity increases linearly. And then the miracle happens, OK? And what Eric, happens? Yes. Uh, your camera went out of focus suddenly. It's hard to see. Oh. Is any, uh, does that help? Yes. Super. I apologize. Thank you for pointing that out, Phil. Yeah. So what, a miracle happens. So once you get to a critical value of pressure that's comparable to the Young's modulus, five times Young's modulus divided by six, according to this simple theory, the cavity can actually expand for without limit at that value of the pressure. So the people call this the cavitation instability. It's a really uh, beautiful result from solid mechanics. And as far as I understand, it was first described by Alan Gent and Lindley in 1959, uh, OK? And um, this, this instability is going to play an important role in the second of half of my talk uh, today. Um, but I do want to point out that, you know, people have tested this and it seems to work uh, reasonably well as long as your material, of course, is still acting like a linear material. But once you get too far and your deformations get too big, all sorts of crazy things can happen. Um, something, if you have strong strain stiffening, you could um, stop the cavitation at some finite value. Um, if you have a damaging process, some sort of fracture process, um, you could stop having a spherical cavity and it could turn into a crack. But 
um, at least at sort of, you know, for, for very nice rubbery materials, you can expand them by a factor of 10 and you'll see very nicely that it, it follows this instability. Hey, Eric. Um, yeah. Hey, this is Cliff. This is really great. I'm enjoying it. Um, I'm sure no one's confused, but I just wanted to mention that the, uh, the uh, x-axis is P, right? R, R versus P. Yes, because if I plotted R versus R, it would be a straight line. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. Okay, now you can see why Cliff is a, a MacArthur fellow, because he pays attention. OK, sorry, I don't mean to tease you. Uh, <laughs> no Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's P versus R. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, anyway, so that's just, that's, you know, that's the cool result uh, from solid mechanics that I wanted to share with you. It goes beyond the scope of what I'll be telling you about today. It's useful in lots of different contexts. But now having seen where it comes from, I think you might appreciate some of the elements of the research talk a bit better. And I'm happy to take your questions. This is all I wanted to say for the tutorial. Okay, thanks very much, Eric, for an awesome tutorial. And I think we're, we're uh, we have a few questions that are coming into the chat. Um, and uh, so we have a clarifying question. And Nicholas Jockman asked if, the, if you're assuming that the material is still incompressible. Um, hey, this whole, this is incompressible the whole way. Right. And then uh, Richard Alert asks if uh, the cavitation instability arises from the framework. How does the cavitation instability arise from the framework that you presented? Yeah, so I'll, I'll say very intuitively within this framework, what happens is that the energy of the cavity after some initial um, transitional period eventually has an energy in the solid that scales like the volume of the cavity. Okay, so, so because the, the, the cavity uh, energy scales like the volume, and so does the work term, as soon as the pressure, the, the prefactor on the work term is bigger than the prefactor um, and the energy term, it can just sort of grow uh, without bound. Um, so I guess that's not quite a physical argument, it's a scaling argument, um, but that's how it emerges, that the, the, the energy of the solid ends up scaling like R cubed big R cubed. And if we have other questions, uh, I, I don't, I, I might be, oh, Marco Poland, sorry, I missed, uh, I, I missed a question. Marco Poland asks uh, if you can give an intuitive explanation for the instability. No, I, I don't, I, I mean, I, I guess, I mean, I, I can give you like a very cheesy one, and saying, oh, it makes sense that when the that when you get to a pressure that's comparable to Young's modulus, anything could happen. Because it's, you know, like you expect large deformations when you get to the Young's modulus. But you know, I don't I honestly I don't really have a, a good intuitive explanation about why this cavity goes. I, I, I can only re, I re, have to resort to this scaling argument that the energy ends up going like the volume as well as the work term. Thank Sorry. you. <laughs> um, I, so thank you for uh, the, uh, thank, uh, I think that I don't see, um, maybe I'm missing questions in the chat, but I, I don't. Is there any way I could ask my question verbally? I'm sorry. Sure, uh, yeah, I'm sorry if I missed your question. No, no, no problem. Um, so I think that there's a little bit of confusion because it looks like the, the video that you showed that the matrix is being compressed, like especially directly around the cavity. Oh, oh thank you. That is excellent point. Yes, yeah, um, Gabriella, that's a great point. So I'm gonna go back to screen sharing because um, yeah, so here's the video it's playing again. So uh, it's, it's being compressed in the radial direction but it's being stretched along the surface. And those two things, uh, local on an element level, on an element at the, at, the, at the, if you zoom in on follow a bunch of material, those two things balance each other out. But the other factor here is in this finite volume, right? I used to have a ton of solid and now I have, um, 
I have a lot of stuff that's just liquid. So where, how do I keep my system incompressible? That's because somewhere far away that we're not visualizing the whole system has uh, gotten bigger, taken up more space. Um, can I say something, Eric? Um, yeah. There is a little bit of a problem because it's, you would expect this picture to be uh, radially symmetric and it isn't. The edges are different from the radial part as far as I can see. Uh, the well, the calculation is, and the math that went into this picture are perfectly radially symmetric. Well, watch, the, watch what happens with the little square at the edges near the axis and near the center. You, the, do you see what I mean? Yeah, um, but they're oriented. The, the squares are not isotropic. The squares are squares. So the squares. That's right. That's the confusing bit. You'd yeah, expect exactly. this, you'd expect the picture to be radially symmetric, and and it isn't. That it it looks as oh, if. The, sorry, I think it's because my mesh is breaking the radial symmetry. That's right. Exactly. I, I think if I drew it as a bunch of triangles, I don't think you would. It would. It would look more isotropic. Absolutely. I, I think you I wouldn't see that. Um, yeah, that's a great, oh God, I'm glad I could think of the answer to that question because it was a, it's a good one. <laughs> All right, I think it's time to move on to the, the research talk. Yes. Yeah.